two Koreas continue to walk a precarious tight rope with increased hostilities along the border. South Korea has forged ahead with propaganda loudspeaker broadcasts near the border for the first time in years following North Korea's trash balloon campaign, which Kim Yo-jong immediately slammed as a prelude to a very dangerous situation. All this while Seoul and Washington further boosted their joint defense posture against the North's evolving threats. For some insights into the rising hostility on the Korean Peninsula and their implications, our regular commentator and senior research fellow at the Institute for National Security Strategy, Kim Myung Hyun, is here with me in the studio. It's good to have you back. It's good to be back. And joining us virtually from Washington is VOA correspondent Jessica Stone. It's always great to see you. Good evening. All right, I want to start with you, Dr. Goh. Uh, a lot has happened while you were gone. <laughs> South Korea has conducted loudspeaker broadcasts for the first time <clears throat> since 2016, and North Korea was quick to react, <clears throat> uh, flying over 300 trash balloons yet again over <clears throat> to the south. How do you assess the current level of inter-Korean tensions? So when we, one has to evaluate the possibility of tension and the level of tension, uh, you have to think about the possibility of escalation. So whether the recent uh, well, provocation by North Koreans of sending these trash balloons could lead to uh, some sort of response from South Korea. <laughs> and uh, the response is that it's going to be difficult for South Korea to respond to this in a way that, uh, I mean, it's, there's no much pressure on the South Korean side to respond in kind, so to speak. Uh, so I think this is very, was very much intentional on the part of North Korea. So. So Kim Yo-jung has just said that uh, if South Korea follows up uh, with uh, North Korea's recent provocation, then uh, North Korea is, has in store a much stronger response. This is in a way, it's a, send, uh, it's a message from North Korea that in a roundabout way saying that they don't want to escalate anymore because uh, if we, you escalate or we escalate more, then, then we have to respond uh, with uh, something more lethal. So. Uh, so from the South Korean point of view, this is you know very kind of uh, like a gray zone provocation in the sense that it doesn't really cross the red line, it doesn't really put pressure on the South Korean side to take on uh, military action uh, or kinetic action of any kind, but then it only this is a political impact on the South Korean society. So this is a very clever move on the part of North Korea, but South Korea has its own response, which North Korea cannot counter easily, which are the loudspeakers. So the chance is that the two sides are remain at this level. Level. So there be, could be more trash uh, balloons coming this way from the north uh, in, the, in the coming weeks or even month. Uh, but then I think the frequency of uh, such events will come to things going to dwindle down over time. And the uh, same with the South Korean loudspeakers. So I think uh, it's going to peter out over time. But we're going to see this time to time in the coming months. South Korea has blared those loudspeakers mm. after some serious events in the past, mm. such as after North Korea's torpedo attack mm. on South Korean warship Cheonan, mm. and also following North Korea's nuclear tests as well. But mm. this time around, you don't think tensions are getting that yeah. as dangerous? Well, with the loudspeakers, uh, the, 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 the before, it was in combination with other action taken by South Korea. Uh, for instance, with the, in the sinking of the Cheonan Corvette, it wasn't just the loudspeaker campaign that the South Korea used to respond to North Korean attacks, but it also came with uh, May 24th uh, force measures, the sanctions, in fact, against North Korea, and also led to major military uh, neighbor exercises taking place in the Yellow Sea. This time around, we are only seeing loudspeaker actions. Right, Jessica, so the two Koreas are ratcheting up hostile behaviors, blaming each other for triggering such actions. How does Washington perceive the newly flared cross-border tensions? Well, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller was pretty frank about how the U.S. views these trash balloons. He called them a disgusting tactic, irresponsible, childish, condemning them uh, and said that they should come to an end. And, you know, Kim, Yong, Kim Jo Young has called the trash balloons sincere presence to the goblins of liberal democracy. And that is not lost uh, in terms of its uh, intent on the U.S. government. Uh, the longtime Korea DC analyst Bruce Klinger wrote about these uh, trash balloons, calling them flying feces, petulant and disdainful. So pretty clear words uh, from those uh, analysts and, and government officials here in, in Washington about the nature of this. And of course, there is no desire on the part of Washington to see this create escalation. 
So malign, uh, destabilizing, and disgusting were some of the words used by uh, U.S. officials to describe the trash balloon campaign. And of course, Washington does not uh, wish to see further escalation of tensions. Dr. Go, North Korea's Kim Yo-jung immediately warned that North Korea will take new responses mm. if South Korea continues to blare the loudspeakers and also continues to fly anti-Pyongyang leaflets across the border. What could she mean by new responses? And do you expect further provocations from the North, perhaps by seizing the opportunity of President Yoon's absence? So there could be a further escalation on the part of North Korea. It's really about uh, opportunities that they uh, they find out uh, in the near future to take advantage of the, any situation that could favor their strategic position. So if they think uh, further escalation is going to benefit them politically, then they will do so. But then I, I think we are going to discuss this later on. But uh, if indeed uh, Russian President Vladimir Putin is going to visit Pyongyang soon, the chances that North Korea is going to use an excuse to stop this campaign because uh, they're not going to engage in provocation that could lead to possible escalation uh, with South Korea while Vladimir Putin is visiting Pyongyang. So uh, I think what, what Kim Yo-jung is saying is more rhetorical than real. One in, so we have to read between the lines here. So I think uh, Kim Yo-jung is trying to send a message to South Korea that this is what we are doing. We don't want to escalate anymore unless we continue, right? So what South Korea can do in response is, uh, I think uh, South Korea also wants to respond to what North Korea has done. But then at the same time, they don't, uh, South Korea also doesn't want to escalate any further. So uh, as I said, before chance is uh, South Korea is going to uh, take a more measured action, uh, say like engage in loud uh, speaker actions, but less frequently. And uh, North Korea is, uh, is likely to notice that also uh, essentially de-escalate the situation by sending fuel balloons uh, in the coming weeks. So when both sides kind of understand that this is a me the message getting across to the other side, then we essentially we have a de-escalation in the near future. And this is uh, ironically could be uh, Putin's face is uh, upside uh, in the overall bigger scheme of things. Some experts say on a similar note that Kim, Kim Yo-jung's verbal attacks this time around was rather weak mm -hmm. compared to the past. So hopefully that could mm. be an indication mm. uh, that North Korea won't conduct any uh, bolder provocations. Mm. Jessica, the third round of the South Korea U.S. nuclear consultative group meeting was held in Seoul on Monday. According to reports, they've completed drafting guidelines on joint response in the event of North Korea's nuclear attack. Tell us more about this and other key points of the meeting. Yeah, so the Pentagon says that uh, South Korea and the United States agreed on uh, procedures to maintain and strengthen the nuclear posture and the nuclear deterrence policy. Um, they will make military assets, U.S. military assets, much more visible. They'll plan joint nuclear exercises with the South Korean military, and they've agreed to do tabletop exercises. This is something, of course, that all militaries do, um, but they're going to be doing them together in a couple of different uh, spheres. They're going to be doing them in a joint decision-making in crisis, in interoperability, in communication. Uh, they're going to do joint nuclear and strategic planning. And the goal, of course, is to continue to integrate the ROK military into the U.S. military response to some of these provocations and scenarios that North Korea could present the peninsula. Um, they're also going to um, uh, have another round of consultations at the end of this year in Washington. So this will continue. Uh, and that's just the sort of policy level but in the, in the intermediary, we may see these uh, joint tabletop exercises begin to be planned and executed. And taking a closer look at the NCG meeting, Dr. Goh, South Korea and the U.S. have agreed to develop various conventional nuclear integration options through their annual simulations and tabletop exercises, as Jessica has mentioned. How do you assess the operational effectiveness of the two allies' current nuclear deterrent system? Well, uh, the recent uh, agreement, uh, you know, likely steps to conduct a more uh, integration between the conventional and the nuclear capabilities of 
uh, South Korea and the United States is, was very much expected uh, from the get-go when the nuclear consultative group uh, came into being. Uh, so many, including myself, uh, expected the NCG to eventually to conclude some sort of planning component. And then we know when NCG includes a planning, then it might become an MPG, and MPG is standing for a nuclear planning group. And this is very significant. The, the name MPG is already, uh, it already exists. Uh, it's in the, in the context of the NATO uh, nuclear sharing scheme. And, and the reason why it's called MPG is because uh, this same exact thing has taken place in the European setting. United States has, is providing extended deterrence with nuclear capability. The European side uh, offers the conventional capabilities. And the two are closely integrated in uh, any war plan uh, that uh, envisages some sort of threats against the European allies uh, of the United States. So same exact steps are being taken between United States and South Korea. And the South Korean side had been demanding this for a very long time and there's a reason why the, the Kim Tae-yo, the Deputy National Security Advisor, uh, claimed that, stated that the NCG would be uh, much, much bigger than the, the EDCG, EDSCG that uh, the NCG came to replace, which was actually a deterrence uh, a strategic consultative group that was uh, the setting or the framework of, in which the United States and South Korea would discuss these kind of issues. So the NCG is going to be much more effective and powerful in the future. And, and the reason is because of the very things that we have observed today. So, uh, and, and then, uh, so or even though the simulation of TTX sound uh, by at this point uh, pretty plain, uh, because it doesn't involve exercises. This, in fact, uh, is a preparatory step for actual exercises that uh, includes the scenarios in which the United States will have to could use nuclear weapons in response to North Korean use of nuclear weapons. So everything has become more realistic uh, in terms of war planning in the Korean Peninsula. Uh, whereas before, the United States and South Korea would ignore the possibility of North Korea using nuclear weapons against the South or Japan, or even the United States, and certain scenarios. But now, uh, the use of North Korea's nuclear weapons has become real and has been reflected. And then each con and it makes uh, the entire defense posture, or the combined defense posture between South Korea and the United States, much more effective and realistic. And this means that we are not, I have to make it be very clear here that we are not prepared for war against North Korea. We are not really raising tension against North Korea, but then by showing to the North Koreans that, that the combined defense posture is much more effective and stronger, it really deters North Koreans from actually using these weapons. So I think uh, this was very much a needed step, but then I dare to say that this is the beginning of uh, such preparation, that we're going to see more of this in the near future with more details fleshed out. So you think South Korea and the U.S. are inching closer towards NPG, Nuclear Planning Group, which is quite similar or equivalent to NATO's nuclear sharing model? So, so in the NPG case, uh, that includes uh, the deployment of tactical nuclear weapons. And so I wouldn't go that far today, but then we are already hearing uh, you know, reports that uh, the Biden administration, which has long been opposed to the idea of uh, raising the profile of nuclear weapons in the overall national security strategy of the United States, uh, as well as the defense of the U.S. allies uh, around the world, uh, is considering expanding the role of nuclear weapons in the national sec uh, security strategy. So uh, that could, I mean, it opens a lot of options here, and then I wouldn't really put off, uh, off the table the option of a redeploying tactical nuclear weapons sometimes in the future. All right, another NCG meeting is set to take place later this year, so we'll mm. keep a close eye on that. Jessica, a U.S. National Security Council official has said that North Korea, China, and Russia are expanding and diversifying their nuclear weapons stockpiles at a breakneck speed, hinting at the possibility that the U.S. may have to increase its own. Tell us more about this, and are there any talks of a possible change in U.S. nuclear policies to counter evolving threats? Well, I think this plays into Dr. Goh's response to your last question about uh, expanding the ideas uh, on the table for the U.S. government when it comes to working with allies against nuclear threats. Uh, Pranay Vadi was the senior director of, for arms control, disarmament, and nonproliferation at the National Security Council. He made some remarks that you just referred to uh, at a forum recently 
and essentially said that the PRC, North Korea, Russia, they're not showing any interest in arms control, so that it's really incumbent upon the U.S. and its allies uh, to use, to leverage arms control, but also to be prepared uh, for the event of a true nuclear war, which, of course, we have not really uh, had a mindset as the American people, I can speak to this, of course, uh, of this being a possibility in the short term uh, for decades, uh, for at least a generation, if not more. Uh, so the, 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 the Biden administration is really looking to update its nuclear weapons employment guidance. It has done uh, some, some work on that and has, uh, says that it needs to account for the growth and diversity of China's nuclear arsenal in particular. It needs to deter Russia and North Korea and China all at the same time from growing their own, uh, their own arsenals. And it reaffirms the U.S. commitment to use arms control and other tools to minimize the number of nuclear weapons around the world and the number of weapons that the U.S. needs to ensure its own objectives and those of the allies that it works with. Um, so essentially, the U.S. is saying it may need to increase its arsenal uh, in the future. Uh, and in the meantime, uh, as we know on so many other levels, especially in Asia, the U.S. is increasing its alliances, its interoperability with South Korea in particular in terms of a military context. It's increasing its military conversations with Japan uh, and, um, and trying to plus up some of its assets in the Pacific region more broadly. Uh, and so this this shows that uh, it's going to continue to leverage those partnerships in the region, but then in the long term, be mindful that if the if these three countries continue to build their assets, that it requires the U.S. to do so in kind. Some might argue differently, but uh, it's a threat not only to the U.S. and its allies, but to the entire world. And as you mentioned, the U.S. and its allies will have no choice but to adjust their defense posture and nuclear capabilities to counter uh, growing threats from those countries. Dr. Goh, Russian President Putin may visit North Korea after visiting Vietnam, uh, which could come as early as this month, according to Russian media. Mm. Japan's NHK even says Putin's visit to Pyongyang may May come as early as next week. Mm. Do you expect the trip to be materialized this time and what sort of outcome do you expect? So clearly the, uh, the possibility of Putin reciprocating the visit that Kim Jong-un made last year to Russia has definitely increased a great deal. I think we are getting more specific dates as well as a uh, justification and also the itinerary of the uh, uh, President Putin around Asia. So, yeah, I think uh, it could happen uh, uh, very soon. Uh, but at the same, another reason why I believe that could be the case is because the Russian government uh, has taken steps to somehow uh, mitigate the uh, negative impact of, of potential Putin's business in North Korea by reaching out to the Korean media. Uh, the recently, uh, President Putin gave an interview to Yonhap News Agency, and uh, in it, uh, Putin essentially had a nice words to say about South Korea and how South Korea stayed on the sidelines uh, in the ongoing war in Ukraine. So uh, essentially, North Korea wants to have, uh, you know, and they have the cake and eat it too. So wants to uh, continue to get uh, military assistance from North Korea. And I think North Korea has made uh, Putin's visit to the country as a prerequisite for the continuation of such, an, um, such assistance. And on the other hand, he also wants to somehow uh, uh, pressure South Korea to remain on the sidelines and not to lend the direct uh, military assistance to Ukraine. Uh, so, but then I think uh, Putin is playing fire here. Uh, there's a clear red line uh, for South Korea. When, and when Putin goes to North Korea, uh, he'll have to somehow make uh, important announcements. I think uh, Kim Jong-un probably expects Putin to do so. And if uh, uh, Putin makes promises uh, that uh, hints at uh, potential uh, military technology transfers, as well as the upgrading of the partnership that the both countries have now, right now, to a level that's uh, similar to an alliance uh, between the two countries, a much closer uh, relationship, not in terms, of, not just in political or diplomatic domain, but also in the military domain. Then I think uh, South Korean opinion about Russia is going to be going to turn really negative, and that could uh, uh, essentially back the current government 
government's uh, critical stance about Russia, especially in the context of the ongoing war in Ukraine. And I think it could backfire on Russia if South Korea especially takes actions uh, by uh, lending direct military assistance to Ukraine. I very much hope uh, that will be the case in the near future, because I think uh, Russia is essentially crossing a red line by uh, agreeing to uh, uh, visit uh, North Korea and have a summit with Kim Jong-un. Well, uh, President Putin's visit will certainly make a big splash in the mm. regional affairs and we'll closely monitor mm. what the two leaders give and take. Thank you, as always, Dr. Go and Jessica, for sharing your thoughts with us. All right, it's my pleasure. You bet. And that brings us to the end of this show. Thank you for watching and be sure to tune in same time tomorrow to join our conversation. Goodbye for now.